about seed faith. I want to share this with you. So I'm led of God's Spirit to do this. And I trust that you will learn a lot from it and apply it for your life. Seed faith is what I said. You want to hear it again? All right. S. So you write S. E. E. D. So push your space bar. F. F. For forward. A. I. T. H. H. For high. You get it? Yeah. Alright, seed faith. Now, this is so important because in our lives, sometimes we have challenges. And many, many times people wonder why it is that what they thought God said to them didn't come to pass. Or why their dreams have delayed. And sometimes it's as though everything is going to work out and, and suddenly it just seems to fail. So week after week, month after month, year after year, and they are waiting. And hoping that things will turn out right. Sometimes after several years of waiting, they give up. God has a better plan than that. So I want to share this with you. It's so important because it affects every area of your life. And whether or not you know it, you have been practicing the principle. It's either working for you or working against you. And it may have been working against you without you knowing it. And another good thing about it is, hey, if you get to know this, whether you know somebody who can help you or you don't, whether you have a job or you don't, you have money or you don't, no matter what your position is in life, Things can turn out wonderfully. If you didn't know somebody who could help you, by practicing this, you will become someone who will help others. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. I like it. Because it's something that is simple for everybody to do. If you didn't have a job, by doing this, you would either have a job, you, in fact you would have a job, and then you would make jobs for others. It's just wonderful. But it is a principle in the kingdom of God that affects every area of life. But as in everything, you'll have to be serious with it for it to work for you. Seed faith. Now what is seed faith? We've heard of the term. Some of you especially old Christians would have heard a lot of times about seed faith. And uh, I've come to find out that many people who use the term don't even understand what it is. It is not written in the Bible, seed faith. There's nothing like that. But it, it is a term that is given to a principle in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So when we're talking about seed faith, we mean the application of faith by the seed principle of life. That's the meaning of seed faith. Seed faith. It, it is the application of faith by the seed principle of life. Two things we need to understand about seed. One is that the seed contains the life-giving principle of what it is the seed of. 
it contains the life giving principle. There is something about a seed that causes it to produce, and that is the principle of life that God has put in it, and that's what makes it a seed. Otherwise, it's no seed. The seed has in it the life given principle. In a sense, it is the source. It is the source of the life of that thing for which it is seed. Secondly, a seed will only bring forth after its kind. A seed will only bring forth after its kind. So in your life, what you need is a seed. Oh, hallelujah. That's what you need. If you could only have the seed, you actually have it made. That's what you need. The seed. So are you ready? I want to go straight to St. Matthew's Gospel. I already talked from Genesis in the afternoon. I tried to show them how that God actually began that principle. Because every major teaching, every major doctrine of the kingdom of God will find its roots, its roots in the book of Genesis. Alright? So I try to show from Genesis how that principle of life came to be. And so we come here to St. Mark's Gospel. And Jesus here relates the seed principle of life to everything in the kingdom of God. So that lets you know without this principle, you just can't move with God. You just can't walk with God. The principle is so important. It affects every area in the kingdom of God. St. Mark's Gospel. Did I ask you to open there? Or did I say something else? Matthew? Yes. I said Matthew? Yes. Because Matthew was open right in front of me. <laughs> said Mark, please. So, Mark is it. Chapter 4. I'm going to read a little long. Uh, we're going to read almost um, a little over um, 30 verses, maybe. Who knows? Something close to that. So, are you ready? Now, the reason I want to read this is because if you get to understand what Jesus said, you will already begin to catch the whole message. So, now, don't just wait for me to finish reading. Follow it. Now, I'm using King James. How many of you have King James translation? All right, good. New King James. There's a difference between New King James and King James. Okay. NIV. Okay. Living Bible. Amplify. We mouth. There are a lot of others. Okay. I just thought to mention one that is not very popular. <laughs> okay. Good. So you try to follow this. I am reading from verse 1. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in, in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Do you understand what's going on here? Oh boy. That little part you can catch understanding of it in St. Luke's Gospel, I, th I think it is the, um, coming from the fourth chapter, something like that. There's something here. No, fifth chapter it is. Fifth chapter. I just wanted to find something there for you. Um, you notice what we read in, in St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 1. Let me read it again. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was, a, there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables. 
You know what I'm trying to show you there? He was actually sitting in Peter's sheep on that day. There was where he met Peter, Simon Peter. Peter owned that ship. That was his, uh, the, the very first encounter with Jesus Christ. Alright, just, just for the records, okay? Another day we'll talk about the importance of that. Alright? Verse 2, And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken! Behold, there went out a sower to sow. Hey, are you following this now? Jesus is teaching here. And it's just like on that day when he was sitting in that ship and teaching them they were on the land and he was teaching the multitude of people. Take it like Jesus is talking to you now. Alright? Because you're hearing right now the same words that he spoke to them that day. And he wasn't speaking just into the thin air. He was speaking to them because he wanted the word of God to affect their lives and produce results. Alright? So you get it. He says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the earth came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit. That sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. This is powerful. Oh boy. What a scripture we just read. What a scripture. Let me tell you about it. I explained it to you one time in church, I remember. This 12th verse. Listen again. He says here. Let me read it from the 11th verse into the 12th verse. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, outside, you understand? All these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Converted means here, Turned around, that the situation will be turned around, and then they are forgiven. What is the meaning of that scripture? He means every time you see the word of God, catch a glimpse of it, every time you hear the word of God and understand it, it will convert you. In other words, it will do something in your life, it will change the situation. So he said, it was hidden from them that they should not see it, or they should see and not perceive, they should hear and not understand. Because if you see it and perceive it, and you hear it and understand it, it will convert you. Oh, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. He's not talking about conversion from Christianity or Islamism. To, that's not what he's talking about. He means it will affect your life. I mean, was he converting them to? They were already in Judaism. Was he converting them to? Christianity had him started. Do you understand? So it wasn't a religious conversion he's talking about here. He's talking about changing their situation. If you hear it and understand it, if you see it and perceive it, then it will do something without you trying to make it happen. Oh, that's powerful. Well, we go on. And, and then he says, and the sins should be forgiven. See, if a man were living in sin and he heard the word of God and understood it, his sins would be forgiven him. Because, see, he would turn to the Lord. And his errors, 
He would say, Lord, I'm sorry. I I shouldn't have done it this way. See, because the word will enlighten him and show him this is the wrong path. This is the right one. Oh, Lord, I've been in the wrong way. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I wouldn't do that. I I come this way. See? It will always work. Amen. 13th verse. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth. Ah, what is it? The word. The sower soweth the word. Which means the word is the seed. But we go on. What I want you to see here is how he relates seed and its principle of life to the kingdom of God. The emphasis is so strong that we just cannot misunderstand the importance. I mean, you have to hire somebody to make you misunderstand it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You've got to pay somebody to turn your mind off this. Okay. The saw so at the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel, or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? Or lampstand. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Isn't this wonderful? If you hear, more is going to be given you. What do you mean more? More revelation. Not just more words. More revelation. The more you hear, that means that you receive it. The more you're going to have. God's going to talk more to you. That's the reason why a lot of folks who seem to always have revelation just keep having more. And those who always say, well, God never talks to me. God never talks to them. Oh, hallelujah. Does God talk to you? How can you say no? Who could say no? You're hearing God now. You're hearing him now. Boy, this is good. Where is the next verse? Verse 25. For he that had to him shall be given, and he that had not from him shall be taken, even that which he had. See, the guy actually had, but he didn't know it. He actually had when he said, ah, oh, I didn't have, God never talks to me. God says, hey, you had. Now you say you don't have. The little that you have will be taken from you. 26th verse. And he said, so is the, oh, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. Hey, we just talked about the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, he said, the sower went forth to sow. And what did he sow? The word. Now we come here in the 26th verse. He says, so is the kingdom of God. He didn't say, so are some things in the kingdom of God. He says, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. He doesn't know how, but it's just working. Are you hearing this? In other words, whether or not you understand the principle, you are sowing and you are reaping. You are sowing and you are reaping. What you have today is the result of what you sowed yesterday. If you are confused, it means you sowed confusion, so you are reaping confusion. This is a truth. You say, I have nothing to do with it, it's the way I was born. 
No. 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 When you started learning to make decisions, you took the power for your life into your own hands. When you start making decisions, you become responsible for your decisions. Are you hearing me? Good. So look at this. Verse 26, one more time. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. In other words, when you sow seed into the earth, without you going inside to bring it up, it will produce by itself. Alright? It's been designed to produce. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately the, he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. And he said, this is 30th verse now, Whereunto shall we lack in the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the earth may lodge under the shadow of it. Wonderful. He says, whereunto shall we like in the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? Again, it goes to seed and its principle of life. So, God's revelation to us about sowing seeds and, 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 and reaping a harvest is not just because He wants everybody to be a farmer. He's teaching us something about famine that every one of us can use for our own lives. Praise God. You know, why does He use famine? Because... Whether you're rich or poor, old or young, male or female, if you sow something, the ground is free. Ground don't talk. So if I sow something into the ground, the ground's not going to say, hey, I don't like you. It's got nothing to do with who I am. I sow the seed right in there, and it will produce. Under the same circumstances, anybody else could do it. It will work just the same way. It doesn't matter who does it. So God uses that to let us know we all have opportunities on the earth. We all do. And no matter how down you are in the valley, no matter how high you are on the mountain, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter what disadvantages you have faced, if you will look at this principle, you could turn everything in your life around glory to God in a moment of time. Thanks be unto God. Hallelujah. So where are you? Are you going to do something about your life? You want to see big things happen in your life? Do you want to see big things happen in your life? Oh, get excited about the word and see this. Alright, now you've understood Jesus made it clear that the seed principle of life is what the kingdom of God operates on. Are we agreed? Alright. Now, we'll look at the Bible and see a few more things. The man who made this message popular was Oral Roberts. He's the one who, who made it popular. He, he preached it so many, many years. And because God taught him many things about seed faith. Seed faith. He, he, he came to understand it. So, possibly he called it seed faith. Possibly, because there's no term like that in the Bible. But we know what he's talking about. You understand? So he may have coined that term because of what he discovered in the Word of God. And um, I, I think it's a perfect term. I, I think I like it. Do you like it? Good. 
seed faith. Faith that we apply, that works by the seed principle of life. Hallelujah. We understand the seed principle and then we apply our faith in that way. And it never ceases to work. It never fails. Never, never fails. He tells a story how this came to make a big meaning to him one time. He was in need and, and he gave some money. And there was a man, a farmer, who had a, a special need in his own life. And that farmer observed that he gave some money and the farmer began to think and that farmer had been a member of the church one time and he stopped going to church but he made this observation and the interpretation came to him as a farmer and then things had gone bad in his life in his in his family things had gone bad it is said that he used to give his tithes he, he wouldn't give him tithes anymore he wasn't giving offerings anymore. Then just stopped coming. He would come and, and sometimes he would stay off church about a month or two. And then finally he just stopped coming. But this opened up a, 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 a revelation to him. And it changed things. So one day he got some money and went to the pastor. And so the pastor was getting a miracle. That's Earl Roberts. He was a pastor then. He was getting a miracle. Because he said he gave that. He gave the money that he gave. And was expecting a miracle from God. And this man came in. And brought some money to him. And the money was seven times what he gave. And then he said... Thank you to the man. And the man said, No, don't thank me. Are you following this? The man, he was conscious that he too was about something. You understand? He didn't just come so he could, Oh, brother pastor, we love you so much. We want to bless you. No, he had a need in his life. And so he brought this money. So what I was thinking, Thank God I got this. The man said, no, don't thank me. He said, you see, I'm a farmer. And I know that when I plant seeds, God multiplies my seed. I brought this money to God to multiply it. So he had a need. And guess what? He got a miracle. Things changed in his business. Or says, people in the church began to observe, not only did the man become so committed in church, he was so committed and things began to work. And he says, just quietly, he says, quietly, his business just went bigger and bigger and bigger. Such that many years later, over 30 years later, he was still a partner in the ministry, giving so much money in the ministry. He could have been down and out. But there, the man learned something, but Earl also got a hold of something there. The man said, I'm a farmer, and I know that when I plant seeds, God multiplies them. So he said, I have brought money seeds to God. He was a wheat farmer. I said, if God will do that, in my farm, he can do that with money. So I, I'm giving God money and I want him to multiply it. Oh, hallelujah. How does God multiply it? Somebody says, well, if I give him a bag of money, am I going to wait at home and wait for bags of money to come to me? Not necessarily. Depends on what you... See, sometimes we are more concerned about the process than with the product. And something is wrong there. 
It's not how God is going to do it that matters. Why don't you leave that to him? Jesus just said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and the guy goes to sleep and he rises up. He says, night and day, night and day. And the seed should spring up and grow up and the man doesn't know how. Forget about the how. Sometimes we give testimony. We tell people how God did something for us. You know, he did this, he did this. And they say, I'm so who did he use? How did the man, what do you mean who and how? Which man? God did it. Hallelujah. Call it seed faith. Seed faith. Have you ever heard of seed offering? Sometimes it's a seed offering. See, people don't understand what's a seed offering. You have to understand what is meant. You say, I want to give a seed offering. Do you really know what you're saying? That's the same way I feel people don't understand when they say seed faith. You're talking about faith that operates according to the seed principle. Praise God. And now you understand it's in the whole kingdom of God. That is the principle on which the whole kingdom of God operates on. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. So uh, let me show you something, book of Genesis. I want to see how it worked first for a man called Abraham. You know that God promised Abraham a son, you remember? And then God also said something in the 13th, I think I should show that to you. 13th chapter of the book of Genesis. The Lord said something from the um, 16th verse. The Lord says, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now this is, this is powerful. He says, I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. Now, there are two things you need to observe about dust. The first one is that the particles are so small and so many you actually cannot number them. You're going to have difficulty in numbering the dust of the earth. Am I right? But if at all you want to make an effort to number the dust of the earth, while you are numbering them, there's more dust coming down. Are you hearing me? So you're going to find, as you number them, there's more. As you number them, there's more. Another thing is this. God said, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Not just as many, but as the dust of the earth. There's another thing about dust. When you wipe out the dust, somehow... You come back and there's more. Hallelujah. There's more. You cannot completely wipe out Abraham's seed. How many times they have tried? Like the dust. You look everywhere and say, no, we're not going to have no dust. Close the windows and the doors. All right. Travel for three days and come back. Where did the dust come from? Hallelujah. God said to Abraham, I'll make your seed as the dust of the earth. Anybody who can number the dust of the earth, let him come number your seed. Hallelujah. There's another thing here. In the 20th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, observe that God promised him a multitude for his seed okay so that, what does a man have he just he has a promise he has god's word like we have god's word god has spoken to us we know that his message for our health has come to us we know that his message for our prosperity has come to us so we have his word but hey you must do something always god requires us to do something and that thing that we do 
sparks up faith. It is the faith action that we take. Hallelujah. All right, so look at this. God said to him, I, I'm going to bless you. And up to this time, he didn't have a child, he didn't have a child, he didn't have a, And God is saying, you will have a multitude. Who am I going to have more? Don't even have one. Then, God had to operate with the seed principle. Now he's beginning to show this man something. Watch it. In the 20th chapter, Genesis, he found himself in the, in the home of King Abimelech. And uh, his wife is so pretty. His, his wife is, his, is over uh, 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 60. Well over 60. But she's so pretty. And the king wants her. Isn't it wonderful? I found out. <laughs> I found out. Men of faith have the most beautiful wives. <laughs> true. True. By the wayside. I have one. Yeah. Yeah. See, by the wayside. Now, look at this. 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 <laughs> Relax. Come on now. Hello. Now, look at this man, Abraham. The wife at old age is so attractive, the king wants her. Then check out Isaac. At old age also, the king wanted her. Isaac. Hey, man, there's got to be something about... <laughs> we must know how to operate our faith. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> All right. So we go. And uh, the man, Abimelech, took uh, Sarah. He wanted Sarah to now be his wife. Would you turn to verse um, 15? I tell you this. God spoke to Abimelech and said, Restore that man his wife. And the man said, Lord, he didn't tell me she was his wife. He said she's his sister. That's why I took her. Then God said, yeah, I know. Otherwise, I would have killed you. Now you go and give him his wife. And the man came to Abraham and said, why did you do this to me? <laughs> All right. So, in verse 15. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, behold, I have given thy brother. <laughs> Very special brother, you know. Yeah, but truly... You see, Abraham said, well, sir, I, I was afraid. That's why I said she's my sister. But I didn't lie. For she actually is my sister. She, she's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. <laughs> and that was true. Praise God. And, and um, on to Sarah, verse 16, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Boy, that's a lot of money. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes on all that are with thee, and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Now, look at this. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife, and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. I mean, he just closed up everybody's womb. Right away. You know why God did it? Listen. The economic power of that day rested in the family strength. Do you understand? Um, there was so much. There was so much. Um, uh, distrust. And people cheated people. So the kings of that day only trusted their own children. To take care of the kingdom. So they put princes everywhere. Over these. The cabinet. Was all the king's children. Do you understand? So they had to have a lot of children. So having children in that day. Was so important to the kings. 
And God just closed up everybody's womb. Nobody had any fertility anymore. He just shut up everything. Hallelujah. Think about it. For the Lord had fast. He did it very quickly. Closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Now, Abimelech comes and says, I know you're a prophet. You know, God told Abimelech, you can read that chapter for yourself. God told Abimelech, he said, good to him for he's a prophet and he'll pray for you. So, Abimelech came to Abraham. After restoring his wife, he said, now sir, would you pray for us? Because we are all... Um, we are all barren. And look at the man who's going to pray for the other man. His wife is barren. Seed faith principle. The man could have said, I can't do that. He could have been angry. He could have done anything. He could have refused. He had the options. But no, not Abraham. He was not afraid. He was not intimidated. Somebody said, how can I be telling people about prosperity when I look at my own life? I don't see anything. I cannot preach. And I'm asking God that he should make the word of God uh, 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 real in my life. Then I can have, then I'll be able to talk to others. You are not going to talk to nobody until you start. Understand it. God didn't. He said, hey, I want my own life to be an example. If God says leap, leap. Don't say, how can I? Have you forgotten I was born like this? If God says leap, what do you do? Leap. No questions. Just leap. If he says tell them, tell them. The man's wife is barren. He's an old man. Doesn't have a child. Everybody born in his house is a servant. And God says now, pray for this man. And his house. So that they can have children. Lord, we don't even have. If you had no child, would you have the confidence to pray for others? So they, they, they can have children? If you wanted to have a child, would you go to a minister that doesn't have to say, please pray for me? I'm talking about TV audience now. You'd be wrong to say, I will not go because he doesn't have. You'd be wrong. You might just be the key to his having. See it? And so God said, Abimelech, hey, go there and wait. Wait. And then Abraham prayed for them. Watch what happens. You know the Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses. Okay, we're in chapter 20. So the next verse in, uh, will be the first verse of chapter 21. Agreed? Watch. What do you get? And the Lord. How can you start a chapter with the word and? That means it's connected to the last verse of chapter 20. Have you noticed? And you might as well say, so the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived. Why? Because Abraham sowed the seed. Somebody else lied. You say, I want God to prosper my business. I want God to do, hey, are you, are you instrumental to somebody else's business study? What have you done? Every time somebody mentions his need, you remember your own. Oh God. Become effective in another man's vision and see what happens in your own home. Right away, as the man prayed for them, miracles happened in his house. The principle of seed faith. You sow it, you reap it. Here is the first one. We get another one. So God didn't only say he was going to have a son. He said you're going to have seed. You're going to have a multitude. Okay, now he got one. He has one son. 
Isaac. His name is Laughter. Sarah said, God has caused me to laugh. And everybody who hears about me will laugh with me. Oh, hallelujah. Who, oh, dear Jesus. I pray that many more will laugh. Let them have Isaac in their job. Isaac, hallelujah, in their homes. Isaac, let God cause them to laugh. Yeah. She said, God has caused me to laugh. How wonderful it is when God causes you to laugh. She looked at herself. She said, how old am I? My husband is 100 years old. She said, how will it be heard that Sarah gave birth? Sarah. And she laughed and laughed at herself. And laughed and laughed. They said, what's the name of your son? She laughed. She said, what else? Laughter. Isaac. God has caused me to laugh. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Say it in your business. Say it in your home. God has caused me to laugh. And everybody who hears about me will laugh with me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we get something here. This is one son he got now. And God knows he will never have that promise come to pass. If he doesn't operate with the seed faith principle. What is the seed faith principle? He said in Genesis 8 chapter and the 22nd verse. Um, before I, I, I explain this to you, let me give you a background here. Look up. You remember that in, in the book of Genesis chapter number 3, the Bible tells us that God spoke to Adam and said to him, You are free to eat of any tree in the garden. But of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Don't eat of it. And the man said, yes sir. One day, can we get the story? Chapter 3, Genesis. Chapter 2, chapter 2 it is. In in chapter 2 he told him about it. And um, let's find this here, find this here, find this here, find this here, find this here. I want to read from verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam... To see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. There was not found a suitable help for him. Nobody to help him. Nobody to help him. Help, help, help. And the Lord God caused Adam, uh, caused A deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. He what? Slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. It doesn't say, therefore shall a woman leave her father and her mother. But therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I could say much about that, but let's go on. So, the man has a wife now. Her name is woman. <laughs> Eve. Eve is her name. And uh, in a third chapter of the book of Genesis, the serpent comes 
and tells the woman that God is a liar. A and the woman tries to believe it. Because seven said, um, did God tell you not to eat of this tree? A and the woman said, yeah, God even said, don't touch it, don't touch it. A a a and uh, why did God say don't touch it? He said, well, God said if we eat of it, we will die, oh. And Satan said, ah, God is telling you a big lie. God knows that if you eat of it, you'll be like him. You can see everything and know everything, you know, good and evil. And try it and see. And the woman said, I don't mind. And they got one. And she took a bite. And the husband was right there, according to the Bible. He didn't go to farm like we were told. He was already in the farm, all right? The farm was the garden. And there was no need going out of the garden to go to farm. Do you understand? He was already in the fan. So, but he was with her right there. And so, uh, the woman took a bite and turned to her, honey, have a bite, have a bite. And, and he took a bite. Mm! And right away, their eyes what? Opened up. And they began to see what they shouldn't have seen. Praise God. Alright, so when God came, Adam, where art thou? Adam hid himself and said, I, I, I'm afraid I'm naked. I, I cannot come out. Who's he hiding from? God. The God who made him. Can you imagine? I'm naked. I can't come out. To who? Almighty God. Adam, and what? how dare you? <laughs> Have you seen that six-year-old boy? <laughs> Mommy comes in the bathroom and says, Mommy, I'm batting. <laughs> He's six years old. He don't want mommy to open the door. I want to bat myself. Mommy and bat it. You say that to mommy. Six years old. <laughs> You're just like Adam. Hiding and say, God, I'm naked. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm amazed for Adam. How could he do that? He didn't hide from Eve. He's hiding from God. I hid myself. When I heard your voice, because I am naked. And God, you know, he's so kind. He said, who told you? <laughs> like you're growing up. Hey, how come? Who told you? <laughs> mm -hmm. That little boy says, you know I'm a man. Hey, are you? <laughs> who told you? And God said, have you done what I told you not to do? Yeah. The woman you gave me, she, she gave it to me to eat. You know I wouldn't disobey you for any reason. But you gave me this woman and, and you said to love her. So I love that. And she gave it to me. I love that. And I had it. So, and God, you know, God, he didn't respond. He just turned to the woman and said, woman, what, what is this that you have done? And she said, oh, I'm so sorry, the serpent, the serpent deceived me. And the Lord, he turned to the serpent. He didn't have no dialogue with the serpent. He said, crush that thou above all cattle. And the guy, all his legs just shrunk. He became a snake. God didn't make no snake. He made a serpent. And the serpent had four legs. All the legs went pew. And he started meandering. God said, upon thy belly shall thou go. That's when it started. But then God said some more. And this is beautiful. I want you to catch this. Watch it. Hmm. From verse 14, I guess. Yep. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 15 will be alright. And I will put in me. God's talking. No, no. 14 is alright. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Uh, by the way, I, I can talk about this another time. You know, the devil hates women. He hates women more than he hates men. You say, ah, <laughs> ah. You give birth to a bouncing baby boy. Hey, you have a bouncing baby girl. Hey. <laughs> That's what happens. Except the guy already has five boys, six boys. Then he says, ah, ah. 
Then he says, okay, you now one girl, just one. Who wants a girl? Watch it now. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Why is it so? Who wants a girl? And yet all of us were born by somebody who was a girl. Isn't it true? Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who oh, in the devil hates women? It came from here. Hallelujah. Okay. Oh, glory to God. So I, I just mentioned to you how that the devil hates women. And it's because of the word that God spoke. I, I'll talk to you about it another day. Now that's very, very important because it will help you to know why some things happen the way they do. Alright? Now that doesn't mean that he makes friends with men. <laughs> Alright? devil hates, he hates men, okay? But um, he has a special <laughs> hatred for women. See, women pray a lot. Women pray for children more than men do. A man can say, well, you know, his son is already 30, 40, and, and he may not pray for him. Until he comes and says, okay, my blessing is with you. But that woman, every day that her eyes will see, they will hit the floor, the knees will hit the floor, and she will pray for her son anywhere in the world. And the devil finds it difficult to destroy her children because that woman won't let them go. Hallelujah. Not only that, so many other things. The husband doesn't pray for the wife as much as the wife prays for the husband. Again, the devil finds it difficult to destroy the husband because that woman wouldn't keep quiet. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, the women are a lot more sensitive to spiritual things than men. That is the reason why, watch this, that is the reason why it is easier for the devil to use a woman than to use a man. You're surprised. Ah, ah. I'll tell you why. Because when you are very sensitive to the Spirit of God, you could also be very sensitive to the devil. So the devil needs very sensitive people. So he can get a woman to do that. When a man believes something, he stays with it. It sticks. When a woman believes something, she may change a man. Can you see it? So man is just like this. This way, always. But the woman is this way and then stops and looks this way and looks this way. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Okay. Now watch it. That's the reason they complement each other. Alright? So you need women in the house of God as well as men. Praise the Lord. Because when you get to... <laughs> You don't know what's happening this way and the other way. You may get into trouble. But when you're always like this and like this, you, you, can, you can move forward the way you should. So we need this way and this way and this way and, and everything together. All right? Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Now here's the point I wanted to make. And um, it's here. From verse 15 we're reading down. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Notice. And between thy seed and her seed. He didn't say between thee and human beings. He says between thee, talk, talking to the devil. He said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. And between her seed and your seed. Thou shalt bruise. No. Uh -uh. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. That, that's a curse on her body. Alright? 
That's a curse on her body. That's where labor came from. She wanted to give birth. And she, they, they, three days labor. Four days labor. Somebody said, I, I've been there for one week. Uh, another one said, well, I just went in and I just came out. Pew. Uh, thanks be on the God. But no matter how, God, um, here's where this problem came from. But we're going somewhere. Are you ready? Good. And then it says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. See, marriage was not intended to be that way. You were intended to be the help to your husband. And he was not to rule over you as a woman. It wasn't supposed to be, I said you are not going out. (laughs) The boss is here. It was not supposed to be so. He shall rule over thee. Came when she let the devil come into her life. But watch this. This is a beautiful thing I want to show you here. In the 17th verse. And unto Adam he said. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee. Saying thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. God couldn't curse Adam. He couldn't. Oh, not because Adam, you're a man. No, he couldn't. How great is our God. How faithful he is. He couldn't curse Adam. He said, I curse the ground for your sake. You're going to have to work and work and work to be able to get something out of it because it will bring to you thorns and thistles. Out of your sweat, you're not going to eat bread because the ground will not yield its increase. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Why did God curse the ground instead of cursing Adam? He cursed the serpent, he cursed the woman, but he couldn't curse the man. Why? I'll tell you. God is wonderful. You know when you study it in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Before Eve was formed. God already formed Adam. And then he blessed Adam. And Adam at the time was both male and female. Did you notice the Bible didn't say that God found that Adam didn't have a wife? It didn't say that. Neither did it say that God found that Adam didn't have a woman. didn't say that. He says Adam didn't have someone to help him. It was a help. Okay? So he took a rib, a bone out of his body, and formed a woman. And separated the female characteristics from the being that he had made. And put in another body. And so you now had male and female. But the man had both male and female characteristics. When he was made. He was called Adam. Adam means mankind. He is the mankind of God. Do you understand? The mankind of God. He was made in the image of God. Male and female created he them then God blessed them Adam that was his name that was him Adam he blessed this man so when he now removed that bone and formed a woman this was a new thing out here okay this was new but this man is blessed And when God blesses, he cannot reverse it. So the man that he had blessed, there's no record for us that he spoke another blessing after Eve was formed. Read it by herself. And now, someone has made a mistake. Eve has made a mistake. Adam has done something wrong. But God, 
He curses the woman and he doesn't curse the man. He curses the ground for his sake. I say that to say this. When God blesses you, nothing changes it. We ought to be thankful for that. Amen. Amen. We ought to be thankful. He never forgets that he blessed you. He's not like that man who one day says, oh, you are the best in the world. And the next day says, you are stupid, you are fat. He's not like that. God is kind. God is wonderful. He never forgets that he blessed you. Because he has blessed you, the rest of your life you work in blessing. If he's so angry with you, he will not curse you. He will look around you. He will have to deal with something else. He says the wicked will be a ransom for the righteous. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you following this? You know when he, when he made David king. He blessed David. Made him king. David made an error. You know what God said? He said choose one of three things. And among the three things there was none that affected David as a human person. As an individual. Not one. Not one. The judgment will come on the nation. The judgment will come on everybody else. <laughs> but not that guy. Why? God cannot reverse it. He's blessed him. It's amazing. God is good. Hallelujah. Okay. So, but here is something beautiful. You, you, you can see now the ground is cursed. Um, it will not yield its increase. Man's going to work so hard and work so hard and sweat to give, get out something from it. The woman, she wants to have children and there's so much pain to go through that she'll dread having a child. But come here. Look chapter 8 here in Genesis. Look at it. Chapter 8, Genesis. Um, we always trace our, our origin to Adam. Am I right? We ought to start doing something new. We should study more. You remember that after Adam and, and his children and so many more, it came to a time that God said there was so much sin in the world. And he said it repented God that he made man. And so he decided he would destroy everybody. He was going to send a flood. It will rain for many, many weeks. And then all creation would perish. But there was only one man and his family that did righteously. And that was Noah. And God said, all right, I'm going to deliver Noah. And Noah and his family became the only family on the face of the earth after the flood. Everyone else died except Noah and his household. Do you remember? So we all came from Noah. Hallelujah. Now, we need to go back and see, did God say anything? Did God tell Noah anything? So Noah is the, is the great grandpa now, you understand? He's the one from where we have come. So did God say anything to Noah? Most of all that people know about Noah is the waters of Noah. That there was a flood one day. If you say, did you ever hear of Noah? You're going to say, yeah, I heard of him. So what did you hear about Noah? Well, there was a flood one day and Noah was saved in his house. That's about all we know. But there's a lot more about Noah than that. Hallelujah. I tell you, this is beautiful. Let's go to chapter 8, Genesis. The floods have come to a stop. And uh, Noah has come out of the ark. He and his family. And now he builds an altar unto God and he worships the Lord who had delivered him so greatly. 20th verse. Are you there now? 8 chapter 20th verse. Book of Genesis. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Woo! Isn't this wonderful? We say, oh, hardship in the world because God cursed the ground for Adam's sake. We don't know. He changed it. He changed it. In the days of Noah, he changed it. It's been a long, long ways back. And God said, hey, no more curse for the ground. 
So it ought to yield its increase now to its best potential. No wonder Isaac sowed in the land and received a hundredfold. No wonder. God changed it. It says, For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smile any more, every living thing, as I have done, while the earth remained. Watch this now, 22nd verse. While the earth remained, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Praise God. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat. Summer and winter, day and night. Hallelujah. So God said it. So we find he's brought in this principle to, to, to Abraham. Hey, let's rush this and, and we'll close with this. He's, got this. he's brought this principle to Abraham. Abraham has a son now and uh, he's so happy. Everybody knows about Isaac and everybody's laughing along with Sarah. Isaac, Isaac, Isaac. Everybody wants to see Isaac. The, the child of Abraham's old age. Everybody wants to see him. He's the dearest thing in the world. And then God speaks and says, Abraham, sir. Do you remember you're supposed to have uh, your seed as the dust of the earth? Oh yes, uh, I'm expecting more and more children. Yeah, in the years to come we'll fill the earth. Yep. But I need something, A.B. What is it, sir? Give me your son. That's easy. I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. Oops. Oh. There's that story they said, Abraham said, oh no, no way, he didn't do that. According to the Bible, the man was ready for God as God was ready for him. He was ready. He had walked with God long enough to understand this great God of glory. See, we are just like that little kid. You gave him something and said, can you give me some? And he said, no. But some others, some other children, they want to give you everything they have. Have you observed it? Yes. Sure. So, God said, Abraham, give me your son. Your only son. That son that you love. God is wonderful. He emphasized it. He said, that son that you love, offer him to me as a bond offering on one of the mountains of Moriah. And Abraham, what did he do? He took the guy and went there. God gave him to me. God gave him to me when I was as good as dead. God gave him to me when I didn't think I was going to have a child no more. God gave him to me when nobody expected me to have one. Took the boy. And went. It's good to think the right thoughts about God. To the guy there. Look at you. You just got some salary the other day. And, and, and God said, give your tax. He said, Mm-mm, I'm owing this, I'm owing this, I'm owing this. I'm going to pay all my debts first. And then after that, I'm going to. And God just looking at you. <laughs> what a mistake. God said, Abraham, your only son is what I want. What's he doing? Seed principle. The guy, he has to sow that seed. Remember what Jesus said? Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abided alone. It abided alone. If the seed doesn't go into the ground and die, it'll remain alone. He says, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So, Abraham, give me your son. And Abraham goes and offers the son. He puts him on the, on the wood, ties him, you know, and gets ready for the fight. He wants to cut him. And then God speaks because he can see the man is serious. And God don't want no human sacrifices. Otherwise, everybody's going to kill his son one day. <laughs> Abraham, Abraham, stop! And the guy, he, he looks up and God says, Hey, I got a ram for you there. Use the ram instead of your son. Now I know. Hallelujah. 
He said, now I know that you trust me. And the guy went, got the ram instead of his son. Now I want us to read this. Are you ready? Chapter 22, Genesis. Rush hour now, rush hour. And I am reading from verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Come on, say amen. Amen. This is wonderful. He planted his seed. Seed in in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. You can see it there. Run there now. Hebrews 11. And I'm reading uh, from the 17th verse. Hebrews 11 chapter. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, that's the same Abraham, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Are you hearing this? And whence also he received him in a figure. What do you mean? He's saying that, when God told a man to offer his son, that Isaac, uh, that Abraham went there, accounting, taking it, that God was able to raise him even from the dead. So he went, he was serious. And the Bible says, when he offered up his son there, ready to kill him, he had, as far as he was concerned, counted it done. And God said, yeah. So when God said, take the boy back home, as far as Almighty God was concerned, that boy had been raised from the dead. For he was as good as dead. Are you following this? Now Abraham is qualified for a harvest. He has planted his son. Are you qualified for a harvest in your life? I tell you something. There is such a thing as sowing a seed for a specific thing. But you see if you sow seeds of help to people. You're going to get a lot of help. Okay. If you sow seeds, like you come to the house of God and you clean all them benches and chairs or whatever, will clean anything, you're going to have a lot of help. You're going to find people helping you to clean things. You see, they'll, they'll do all this for you. And then some of you, you help to cook. You help people to cook, you know. You, they, they have a party and then you show up and you cook and you do all these things. When you have a need like that, you're going to find people just coming and coming and they want to cook for you. They're going to help you. You're going to get a lot of food, cooking, cooking, cooking. Praise God. Oh, yeah. You're going to have a lot of good help like that. But you need money. You've got to sow money seeds as well. Can you see it? Some people wonder why they get a lot of other stuff. But when it comes to money, they don't have. Because they don't sow money seeds. Sometimes people wonder. They get some money, all right. But there are a lot of things that just don't come to them. Because they don't give. See, you're going to learn to sow seeds in your life. Your life, a farmer, doesn't just sow. If you live your life on that farm. If you know that your life is dependent on that farm, you will sow continually. Now we call it faith, uh, seed faith because when we sow the seed, we reap a harvest. And so when we release our faith, we base our faith on the principle of the seed by releasing a seed. If it's a money seed, if it's a cotton seed, if it's a housing seed, I told you one time, I gave someone money i paid for someone's transportation i was a young guy on the market square and i paid for the person's transportation we, we escorted that one there when i did the spirit of god spoke to me right there and i told the folks who were with me he said you have just paid for your car that day 
And that's many years ago. I wasn't expecting, oh, I was a student, I, I wasn't expecting anything. But when I did, he told me that. And I told him, I said, you know what? I will never have to struggle to get a car. And I never did. All that way, right from school, I never had to suffer for it. Not once. Why? Because God loves me so much, he just wants me to have... No, he loves every one of us. But he says, there's a principle in the kingdom. You're going to have to work with that principle. It, it, it works. You need it. You need it. You need it. Use it in your life. You don't have a job. You need money. Whatever it is. Find the opportunity. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. And put money in there. We're rich in people. Rich in people. Blessing people through TV, through several programs, the tapes, the books, and so on and so forth. We are ministering to people. And what's happening to these people? Their lives are changing. You can get involved like that. And you're so insistent. It's not just, not just giving without knowing what you're doing. You're calling it money seeds. They are money seeds. You're like a farmer. See, many people didn't have an understanding of farming business. I used to follow my grandfather to the farm. Every time we went on a holiday home, Grandpa, there was only one thing he knew to do, and that was to go to the farm. See, he was a minister. But see, in his spare time, he liked to go to the farm. And we went to the farm. And he roasted some, just, just being around Grandpa. <laughs> it was something nice. But he gave us something. I noticed that he loved to farm. And I got to understand that farming was something important. Now, when I got to school, we studied some agriculture. And then I learned some more about famine. But I didn't know it was so important in the kingdom of God. Now I see it. Praise God. Now I see it. There are people here you have never seen a farm in your life. Yeah, because you moved from where you are to Lagos Island. And then from there back home. And you go through the express. Where are you ever going to see a farm? My daughter said to me one day, she said, I've only seen a moat. I've never seen a butterfly. I said, you have to see one soon. <laughs> Why does she see a moat? In the night, there's lights and then there's moats that come in. In the daytime, she goes to this place or that place and you don't see them butterflies. So she said, I've never seen a butterfly. Some of you have never seen a live chicken. You've only seen the meat. You've been eating the meat. meat. <laughs> You've never seen a live chicken. Am I right? There's some of you here. You've never seen it live. Some have never seen a goat. Listen to me. This is true. This is true. Some have never seen a goat. If you go to a village, you're going to find goats crossing the streets. And not many here. That goat may not get back home. Are you still here? I just said that to say this, because some things don't seem to be real to us, we find it difficult to imagine them. You sow and you reap, you sow and you reap. Were you not once a young guy learning to maybe cook, playing with other mates, just playing and, and putting a, 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 a tin, uh, an empty tin, maybe a, a, a margarine tin, and you set a little fire on that, and you put some sand inside with some water, and you tell the other guy, I'm cooking rice for you. <laughs> do you ever do that? Yeah. We did that, and we had some little garden, just all by ourselves, and we put some corn seeds there, one, two, three, four, and every day we came to check it, whether it was growing. <laughs> and the thing sprouted. Just to see that. A little tomato garden, just you know, one, one meter by one meter, and we had tomatoes there. Just to see it grow. Do you understand? And the ground didn't say, you are too small, I will not cause anything to grow for you. Thanks be unto God. No matter where you are, now go back home and you think. You don't have enough money, relax. Think, what else can I do? I want to get myself into big business with God. Big business with God. That's what I'm going to do. I, I, and I'm going to be sowing regularly. It's because my life depends on it. 
have is sowing and reaping. Have is sowing and reaping. The Bible says, Isaiah chapter 55 and the 10th verse. He tells us that the ground makes it bud. It makes it grow bud. So that, that's when the rain falls on the ground. Alright? So, so that, here's the line I want to pick for you. It will give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. I thought it should say bread to the eater and seed to the sower. Nobody says seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Which means you get your seeds out first. The seed for sowing must come out first. When you get your harvest, take out your seed for sowing. Otherwise, huh, you are not going to have a harvest next season. This money you just got is going to finish. See, if we were back in the village right now, I will talk to you about your corn and your yams and all that stuff. You understand? Because that, you relate with that. But you can relate more with money than with corn and, and, and yams and so on. So that's the reason I'm talking about money more. Because that's what you relate with on, a, on an everyday level. Praise God. But you have to plant your money seeds. He says, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So take out your seed for sowing first. If you take bad seed, you're going to sow bad seed. And when you sow bad seed, how many of you know you're not going to have a healthy crop? It will not be healthy. Thin, yellowish leaves will come out. And all their maids will be growing and yours shaky. And then very small fruits. Small. You wonder why is my guava so small? Why is this mango so small? The other guy comes and says, I've never seen such big apples all my life. And yours is so dry and small. You take a bite and there's not enough water in it. Ooh, dry. Why? It came from the sick seed you put down there. You're going to do something about your life. God told me to share these things with you. And we're just beginning. So we're going to be learning more from the Bible. And seeing these things um, applied in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you want a job? Start praying for others who don't have jobs. Start praying for them. Stop being concerned about yourself. Get out of the rot. And start praying for others. Start blessing others. Start declaring good things for others. Don't say, oh God, everybody that doesn't have a job. No, that's, that's casting your seeds in the wrong place. Pray for people specifically. See, you have to know people, okay? Don't live on your own only. Think about others. Get involved with others. Be in a cell group, in a PCL. There are people you must know there. Maybe somebody got, who, who needs a job. Someone's just lost his job, maybe, or they, they lost him. Depending on how he was, how he was performing. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Are you ready? So if you say, oh Lord, this year I must get married. Lord, this is September. I must get married. And uh, December. Okay, pray for some others who, who, instead of trying to, you know, Lord, I don't know if that sister is already having somebody or not, but I'm claiming her. Don't claim her. Pray that she would have somebody. Pray that she would have somebody. It doesn't have to be you. Pray for her. Glory to God. That she'll have somebody. That when you pray for her, who knows? You may just answer her prayer. Maybe you, who knows? And, and, and sister, you pray for brother. Don't try to come to brother. I've not been seeing you. Don't just, oh, come on here. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to his holy name forever. Hallelujah.